I want to talk to you about opening your spiritual eyes in the era of the mouth. Since God gives us dreams and visions every night, he is pouring out his spirit on all flesh. Sons and daughters are prophesying, we're dreaming dreams, we're having visions, but so is the world. And people don't know what their dreams mean. And I have found that one of the best evangelistic tools is using dream interpretation, prophecy, or, and uh, evangelism to minister to the lost. We went to Hong Kong and rented a booth down in the prostitute section. It was a tarot card reader's booth. I thought they would leave when we rented it. They hung out. And I'm thinking, why is she still here? I'm taking over. And the, the team that was with me goes, Barbie, why don't you give her a word? I said, great idea. So I reach across the table because this is a third generation psychic who's a tarot card reader in a prostitute section. And the Lord began giving me words of knowledge for her. But I'm holding her hand so that she cannot go into a trance. Because, you know, if she's moving in the occult realm, she's got some extra critters in her that are going to try to divert her so that she's not able to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. So I'm doing a trickle charge of love into her as the Holy Spirit begins to say she has tried to commit suicide three times. She has irritable bowel syndrome. And he gave me a whole list of words about her. And then she started crying because she hadn't felt love like that before. And then I said, do you want to meet the lover of your soul? And she said, yes. And I said, then pray this after me. His name is Jesus. She got born again. She leaves the booth. Yes, give him glory. She leaves the booth, runs and gets her mother, brings the other psychic tarot card reader to the booth. God gives me words of knowledge for her. I said, I see you like a beautiful songbird in the garden with rose bushes and the petals have dew upon them. Oh, my name is Rose. And I love to sing karaoke. <laughs> I'm not sure if I wanted to be at that performance, but uh, she was, and again, God said, and I want to heal her knees. So, of course, my hand's already on her, and I said, and the Holy Spirit wants to heal your knees because you're in great pain. Tears come down her face. She meets Jesus. I said, do you want to meet the lover of your soul? Yes. Who is it? I said, his name is Jesus. He's the one that just healed your knees. He's the one that named you Rose because he is the Rose of Sharon. He is the bright and morning star. And so God is bringing us into a time where we're able to use the gifts of the Spirit in order to evangelize the places of darkness. God is moving in a miraculous way. You know, in the beginning of the earth, when God created the heavens and he created the earth, he came as the dove and he hovered over formless and void. And there was a moving of his spirit, and that's the first time we see a moving of the spirit of God is in Genesis. And he took that time, and he began, and it took him seven days to complete everything. Six days he labored, and on the seventh day he entered into rest. So when he created Adam, and Adam met God, he met him out of a place of rest. Because God knew that we had to learn how to enter into rest to receive the promises, to be able to take on the divine nature of God. And so he enters into rest after the six days, and the dove had hovered and separated. You know the story. Separated darkness and light and water and land, spoke to the plants, had everything grow, and then he said, and I'm going to give man dominion over the earth. I love that Troy is having those lawyers come in. My dad was a lawyer. And today I read some articles on COVID and what it's doing to our children. And it's time that the church stand up and take charge. And we open our mouth in the era of the mouth. And we begin to decree and declare what can be permitted on the earth and what cannot be. Because heaven's getting ready to pull some permits, things that we've allowed to take place on our watch. And he's getting ready to bring a movement forth of power and demonstration where the fear of the Lord's going to be restored in this hour. 
and we're going to be moving in signs, wonders, and miracles, and they're going to begin to ask permission before they try stuff. Because they're not going to want the retribution that's going to come forth from a church that rises up with healing in her wings and begins to decree and declare and prophesy by the mouth because we're in the era of the mouth. That which we have seen in dreams and visions for the last 10 years, God is now getting ready to perform in the times that we're stepping into now for the next 10 years. And we're getting bigger we're getting brighter, we're rising, and we're shining. And this is a time to be a springboard to launch into the things that God has for us. You know, God created everything in those seven days, and he put it in the realm of glory. Everything was created. That's every answer of prayer. That's every problem solved. That's every solution. That's every miracle. That's every dream. That's every person. He wrote everybody's name down in the Lamb's Book of Life. Everyone that would ever be born. He made provision for salvation. The Bible says those who do not receive him, their names have to be blotted out. You know, the world talks about how could a loving God send somebody to hell? Well, he doesn't. He died for our sins. He shed his blood. His body was beaten beyond recognition. He made the provision. He wrote their name in the Lamb's Book of Life and said, your salvation is assured. Just receive my son. But our life is about learning how to step into that realm of glory so that we can access everything that has already been given to us. Sometimes we think, well, God didn't answer my prayer. Maybe he didn't answer it in the way you thought. But that night when you went to sleep and slumbering on your bed, he opened up your soul and he poured in a dream. And he answered you through a parabolic story that showed you through a symbolic language what you had prayed about. But that's his language, and his language needs to be interpreted. So he's asking us to begin to learn to understand the messages and the symbolism, parabolic things of the Spirit, just like he trained the disciples when he was here on earth through parables. I always wanted to be a disciple. When I was growing up in the Presbyterian church, I would sit on the back row because I always did the head nod, It wasn't a real exciting church, but it was where the first punkers came in. All the old ladies had blue, purple, and pink hair. You know, the young people think they've started something new. Uh Uh-uh. When I was a little kid, the 80-year-old grandmas were already punking it out. So that's nothing new, and Ecclesiastes tells us that, that there is nothing new under the sun. So... We'll let you take credit for that, but that's really an old ladies thing. (laughs) Just saying. But I asked him, I said, Pastor, when are we going to do the stuff? And he said, what stuff are you talking about? I said, you know, where deaf ears are open and cripples walk and that type of stuff. And he said, oh, honey, that doesn't happen anymore. That was only for a certain dispensation and time. Who would talk to a kid about a dispensation? I'm thinking, I just hope God it never jumps on me, because it sounded horrible. (laughs) And I was out riding my horse, and I said, God, I'm really upset with you. Why would you love those people back then more than you love us now? Why would you do signs, wonders, and miracles for them, but all of a sudden, because a disciple dies, they quit? And an audible voice called my name, Barbie. Now I was very excited, because I knew I had a talking horse. And I'm thinking, TV's in my future. I'm going to go now on TV with my talking horse, just like Mr. Ed. That dates me, but... And then I'm looking at the horse's mouth, waiting for him to talk to me again. And the name is called Barbie. And again, Barbie, but the mouth doesn't open. Then it dawns on me. It's not the horse talking to me. It was the audible voice of God calling me as a young girl, out riding a horse, upset that he didn't do miracles anymore and that the church was so boring I would sleep on the back row and sneak out and go get pizza and lead all the elders' kids with me. And we knew what was going to happen because they gave us a bulletin at the beginning. 
So I knew I had this much time, and then I needed to be back in there so that I wasn't missed. And I would just go, great service, shake his hand, way to go, guy. But when he had patted me on the head and said, those things just don't happen anymore, God had to intervene with an audible voice. And he did it. And he gave me the scripture in Hebrews that says, I change not. I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the great thing about that is we're in the best of times. We're in the era of the mouth. God used his mouth to create the world and the universe. And every one of our prayers, every one of our dreams, everything was created at the Genesis. Think about all that knowing, all that awesomeness that he knew you would be here in this time and in this era. And he created and formed you in his loins. Just like he spoke to Job, he said, Job, you were with me when I formed the worlds out of nothing and I hung it out there in an atmosphere when there wasn't one. Job was there and so were you. There are so many mysteries that God is revealing to us out of the scripture now. And he told Daniel, he said, Daniel, seal these mysteries up until a future time when knowledge is able to travel to and fro. It's the gateway of heaven where we ascend the ladders just like Jacob's ladders were. He leaves his homeland on his way to find a wife. And when he gets to a certain place, it says that he lays down there and there's a stone there and he goes into a dream and there's a ladder that descends from heaven at his head and at the top of that ladder he sees Jesus. And when he sees him there, his angels all ascend up that ladder. I'd be going, whoa, wait a minute, I need those angels. Don't be taking my angels. What are you doing? But the neat thing is when one era ends, we just ended the era of the seer, where God poured out seeing ability through dreams and vision so that we could enter into the era of the mouth so that we could decree and declare what's permitted and what's not permitted according to God's blueprints. But he's also released a whole new set of angels. And these guys are bad dudes. These angels are not anything to be messing with. And they're going to be spreading their wings and spreading their power and spreading their anointing and spreading their healing and bringing us messages from heaven so that we can decree and declare a thing so that God can establish it. It's just like when God dropped Ezekiel in a valley of dry bones and he said, now Ezekiel, you prophesy the way I command you. And when the church rises up and we prophesy the way God commands in this era of the mouth, Bones are going to shake, rattle, and roll. And they're going to come together. And God is raising up that army. And he is speaking to them. And he's breathing their, his ruach, the creative breath, into them, just like he did to Adam. He took and breathed the ruach, which is the creative force, into that clay and water form. And it said it became a living soul. God can form something out of nothing. And he has formed everything that we need, and he's given it to us already. All we have to do is step into it and apprehend the realms of glory where everything is concealed for us. It reminds me of when Nicodemus, the ruling leader of the Jews, he comes sneaking to Jesus at night. And he says, Rabbi, I know that you are a man of God because you could not do the things you do, the miracles, unless you were sent by God. And Jesus says, yes, you're right. I've sent by God. And he answers him. He says, unless you were born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. We don't even have spiritual sight until we're born again. And that's why it's so important that we go out into this world and we begin to evangelize and bring in those that are lost so that their eyes can be opened. They're blind. They can't help the way they act. They're stumbling around in the blindness, in the darkness. And Jesus said, most assuredly, I say unto you, unless one is born of water and of the spirit, he can't enter into the kingdom. So we can't see it or enter into it. And since God has answered everything and put it in the realm of glory, and it says that it's the Christ in us who gives us the hope of obtaining glory, we have to have the resurrected Christ in us resurrecting so that we recognize him. 
He comes into us at salvation in his fullness. Because the Bible tells us he does not give us the spirit by measure. So if he didn't give me the spirit of God by measure, that means he gave it to me in the fullness. And if I'm not operating in the fullness, is it his fault? It's my fault. Because the Bible says if I will seek him with all of my heart, he will be found of me. And when I find him in that dimension, then he resurrects and he takes dominion. Now that dimension of Christ is moving in and through me because I have discovered him and I see him face to face and we become intimate in that knowledge of Christ Jesus. In John 14, the Bible says that Jesus tells us, he says, I go before you. And he, he says, fear not. Let me find my little notes here. Fear not. You believe in God, believes also in me. He said, if I, I go before you to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will also come again, that where I am, you may be there also. So he's gone before us. He's prepared a place for us in the mansions of his father. And that's not just going to heaven when you die. Mansions, heavenly mansions are states of being. If we're living in a state of poverty or a state of fear because the news has told us to be fearful, don't go out of your house, don't take off your mask, go get a vaccine that's going to change your DNA and alter it forever. The article I read today said that it's, it's doing that to our 12-year-old boys, especially it's, it's attacking their heart muscles so that they're, they're going into fibrillation like a 70-year-old man. They said that they had over 9,000 reported deaths from the injections, which is more than they've had in 30 years of all the vaccinations that have ever gone out. This is something that we have to address as the church and as believers. This is something that we have to pull the permit for and say it's not going to be permitted any longer. And the neat thing about it is we get to be the ones that have the healing in our wings that reverse the curse. So if they had the vaccine and it's damaged their body, we bring them into the healing and we say no more, be restored. Because in Isaiah it says nobody says restore, but the church is getting ready to say be restored and come into your healing, come into your wholeness, come into the fullness of what God has for you because God doesn't come into us with measure but he comes into us in the fullness. And so we're going to tap into the healing miracle dimensions of the Christ who is in us, who is the hope of us obtaining glory, and we're going to begin to move into that realm of glory, and we're going to be healers. We're going to be deliverers. We're going to go into the dark places, into the highways, into the byways. We're going to take them the little word of God, and we're going to put the word in their hand, and we're going to say, this is the living word. This is Jesus. This is who you need to know. And Jesus tried to tell Nicodemus all about simple things. He said, Nicodemus, you're a leader among the Jewish people, and I'm trying to tell you simple things, yet you don't believe and you don't understand. How can I share with you the things of my father's mansions? How can I tell you the mysteries that God wants to reveal so that you can begin to move out of poverty, out of lack, out of sickness, and come to the place where I am? because I've gone before you. And the word says that if I go before you and prepare a place, I will come again. And that's not talking about the second coming of Christ when he comes with all the saints and the horses and the trumpets and the heavens are rended and we have that second coming. That's talking about when he comes through a dream, when he comes through a vision, when he comes through a rhema word, when he comes through a message and we have an aha moment and a rhema a live awakening in us, Christ has come again. And we resurrect that part of him in us so that now we have that authority to move in that which we have understanding of. Because the Bible says that knowledge will fill the house. And you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so he's going to fill us with understanding because he's created everything and he has given it to us because we are joint heirs with Christ. When John the Revelator was on the 
Isle of Patmos, Christ was standing behind him. He said, I heard a voice speak behind me. You know, I want him to hold my hand. I want him out in front so I can just follow. But there comes a point where we have to be adults and we have to step into becoming a bride of Christ and the sons of God. Because God said that the whole world is crying out for the sons of God to be manifest. And John the Revelator had God backing him up and all of heaven backing him up. And he says, John, I want you to write what you see, write what you hear. And he heard what the Spirit have said. And it, of John, it said, he knew how to enter into the Spirit. He said, I knew how to enter in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Well, this is the day of the Lord. And we're learning to enter into the realm of the Spirit so we can apprehend everything that God has already given to us. I was just at the prophetic summit with Cindy Jacobs. Troy was there and so many others. We had over 100 prophets that flew in from all over the world. And at the end, Cindy put all the prophets up on the stage and she was knocking us all out. Well, not knocking us out, but you know how, how we do. Boo. We fall out. And she was saying, I'm praying that God give you all a new gift that you don't even know that you have. God wants to give us and explain to us and show us that we can demonstrate the new thing that God is doing. And Isaiah says, behold, I do a new thing. Do you not perceive it? And see, I get bored very easily. I have a creative, vivid imagination. I love to dream the impossible dream and then watch God produce it. When my brother used to work with me, he said, Barbie, quit coming up with all these new ideas. I can't keep up. I just, you know, don't, don't you tell me one more new thing. But God is a creator. And he wants us creating and moving and imagining and discovering. And you have new gifts that are within you, just like those new angels have come down that ladder. You have a whole army of angels that God wants to be able to release to move with you, that we can dispatch, that we can send some to Washington or wherever else they need to go. Angels get bored too. And angels can't do anything unless we assign it to them to do. In Ephesians 1, 15 through 23, Jesus said that he, the Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. We're going into 22. 22 2022 is the year of enlightenment, and it's not a new age term. That is a Bible term. God is getting ready to release the enlightenment in us by the eyes of the Spirit, and that when our eyes are enlightened by the Spirit, we see into a future realm prophetically so that we know what the Father wants to do. Jesus stood on the earth, and it says that he looked into heaven, and he saw what the Father was doing, and then he mirrored it on earth. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, in this earthen vessel, and on this earth as it is in heaven. And when God created in the Genesis, he gave us dominion. He said, you rule, you reign, you take authority, you prohibit and you allow what you will allow according to my word, and I will have heaven back you up, just like Jesus stood at the revelator and backed him up. And the church has finally come to a season when the fivefold ministry has been restored, and we're moving in the power and the authority that God talked to us about in the Genesis, and he is saying, I've gone before you, and I prepared a place for you that where I am, you may be also, and you know the way to get there. And he said, and I'm coming to you. And the Bible tells us in Revelation that when Christ comes to us, he comes to us with his reward for us already in his hand. I love getting rewards. I taught kindergarten for many years, and I give them those little stickers on their head. That's a good girl. Here's your sticker. Well, I want more than a sticker. I want power. I want authority. I want dominion. I want to be good, acceptable, perfect will of God. And we can determine which area of that pleasing that we want to be in God. But I want us to choose the perfect will of God.
because that's where the greatest rewards come in. And the more souls that we bring in, that's God's inheritance. He's wanting a big inheritance, so he's wanting us to bring in that reward. So he's bringing us into a place where we can look and go into the future being spiritually enlightened that we may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. You know, the Bible says that God gave his glory to Jesus, and Jesus turns around and gives it to us. And he's the hope of glory, us reaching glory because it's the Christ in us As we discover him, we step into a different realm of glory, to glory, to glory. And he said, God, the glory that you have given me, I give to them. And that's not when we're dead and off in heaven. That's the glory realm here for us to rule and reign with, for us to fill stadiums with. When I was a little girl, I had a vision of the Lord coming to stadiums. And he came as the cloud that was in Exodus, The Israelites wouldn't put their foot on the mountain because they had not gone through the preparation process. They said, Moses, you go up and talk to God for us. We'll stay here. You just come back and tell us what he says and we'll do it. Not. But the church has been through the fire. We have been through the crucible. We have been crucified with Christ. Never yet we live. Yet not us, but it's Christ living in us. And he is getting ready to rise with healing in his wings. And he's coming back in a glory cloud to stadiums. And that glory cloud covered from one side of the stadium to the other side of the stadium. Lightnings, gold, angels. And there was some person on the stage that knew how to work the word of knowledge. And they were calling out words of knowledge for the heathens and the unchurched and the radicals and the whoever, whatevers were out there. And when that cloud moved from one side of the stadium to the other, everybody that was in the stadium was healed. Everybody. Dead were raised by little housewives and teenagers. Creative miracles took place where people that didn't have arms and limbs and eyes or missing organs, people of ordinary like you and me were laying hands on them and arms were popping back. Eyes were coming into place. We live in the greatest times ever and we're at the window. We're at the open door, so to speak, where God is saying, Behold, there's a voice in heaven, and there's an open door there, and the voice is saying, come up here and let me show you what is soon going to take place on your watch. And it's good, and it's powerful, and it's dominion, and it's healing, and it's not just miracles, it's creative miracles. Two years ago, I lost my sister to kidney cancer that went into her bones and ravished her body. The Lord said, Barbie, go to Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, and I will speak to you there. I'm thinking, I don't want to leave. I don't want to go. He goes, you go there and I'll do something special for you. Because I had laid hands on her and I was casting the spirit of cancer out of her. And the Holy Spirit said, stop, wait. I'm thinking, wait, we're supposed to do that. He goes, the creative realm for miracles hasn't been released to that dimension yet. You have to go do it. I got to the place where he sent me in Malaysia, and there was a door that said, uh, Miracle Gate. He said, now prophesy to that Miracle Gate that it becomes a creative Miracle Gate. And he released creative miracles into the earth realm. Long story short, because I've got a minute 36. I'm in Texas. She's dying in Florida. The Lord says, tonight's the night that I'm going to visit her and ask her which way she wants me to pour the prayer bowls. I had mobilized the whole world to pray for her. I went in the realm of the Spirit like Paul did because I didn't want her to be alone when she died. Jesus walked into the room. He walked up to her bed. He took her by the hands and he kissed them and he said, Brenda, Barbie mobilized the whole world to pray for your healing and the prayer bowls in heaven are full and I need to ask you, which way do you want me to pour the bowl? Do you want me to pour it one way and you will receive a brand new whole body, all your organs, bones, kidneys, everything will be restored and you can go into miracle ministry with her and travel the world? 
or if you had rather, I will pour the bowls the other way, and you will receive a spirit body, and you can enter into your reward and go to heaven with me right now. Brenda's in heaven. But she was the seed that fell into the ground in order to release the creative realm of miracles. She was a very selfless person. And she chose to be the seed that would fall so that you and I could step into creative miracles. That was a price to be paid, but she paid it because Jesus paid it at the cross. And it's his blood and it's his stripes that bring us into everything that we need.